In this short video, we're going to look at a different product of vectors. It's called the cross product or the vector product, because unlike the dot product, which produced a scalar, the cross product is actually going to take two vectors and produce a third vector. Now, why would we need a new operation on vectors, which will produce a third vector? Well, we're going to see throughout the course that many times we have two non-parallel vectors in space. So they're in R3. And we need to find a third vector, which is orthogonal to both vectors. Let's look at an example. Suppose I have two vectors, A, with components 2, comma 1, comma 0, and my vector B with components 3, negative 1, and 1. And I'm trying to find a vector C, which is orthogonal to both A and B. Well, remember, in terms of the dot product, Orthogonal means the dot product is going to be zero. So let's call the components of C, C sub one, C sub two, and C sub three. If C is orthogonal to A, then the dot product C dot A must equal zero. So using those components, C dot A would be two times C one, plus 1 times c2 plus 0 times c3. So I get the equation 2c1 plus c2 equals 0. Let's do the same thing with the b vector. If c is orthogonal to b, then the dot product c dot b must equal 0. So again, forming the dot product with the c vector, I'll get a new equation involving c sub 1, c sub 2, and c sub 3. Now both of these equations have to be true in order for this desired condition to hold true. So we're going to get a system of equations. Now we can see that this system of equation only has two equations, but there are three unknowns, c sub 1, c sub 2, and c sub 3. And if we remember from our algebra class that a system of equation with more unknowns than equations is going to be a dependent system, which means it will have infinitely many solutions. Now, that makes sense based on the geometry of this problem. If you have a vector which is orthogonal to A and B. Well, if I multiply that vector times any scalar, whether it's positive or negative, I'll get a new vector and it will still be orthogonal to A and orthogonal to B. So it makes sense that we should have infinitely many solutions. But we're not interested in finding all of the solutions. We just want to find one solution. So let's use elimination and eliminate C1 from these two equations. So I'll multiply the top equation by negative 3. I'll multiply the bottom equation by positive 2. And then I'll add the resulting equations together. That will give me negative 5C2 plus 2C3 equals 0. And this equation has infinitely many solutions. I just need to choose a value for C2 and a value for C3, which makes this a true statement. And so what I'm going to do is leverage the coefficients to help me find a solution. So what I'll do is I'll say, let's take C2 to be the opposite of the coefficient on C3. 
and then we'll let C3 be the exact coefficient on C2. And that will always give me a solution. If I choose the opposite of one coefficient on the, for the other variable and just choose the coefficient uh, without changing the sign for the other variable. And we can see I'll get what? Negative uh, 5 times negative 2, that's positive 10. But 2 times negative 5 makes negative 10. And that adds up to 0. Now, once I've chosen C2 and C3, I can go back and find C1 using either equation. So I'll use equation 1 or the first equation because it only has two terms. So C1 would be uh, negative 1 half of C2. So C1 would equal 1. And my C vector would have components 1, comma, negative 2, comma, negative 5. So we don't want to go through and have to solve a system of equations every time we need to do this operation. Um, so what we'll do is we'll look at a general case and see if we can come up with a formula for the cross product. So we're going to repeat the same steps that we just did. But instead of using A and B, which have fixed numbers, they're just going to have a sub 1, a sub 2, a sub 3 for the components of the a vector, and b sub 1, b sub 2, b sub 3 as components of the b vector. So we want c dotted with a equal to 0 and c dotted with b equal to 0. That ensures that c is orthogonal to both vectors. And we're good at system of equations, just like we did in our example. Now we're going to eliminate C sub 1 from that system of equations. So I'll multiply the top equation by positive B1. And I'll multiply the bottom equation by negative A1. So now I'll get two new equations, and I'll add them just like I did in the example. Now, when I add them, I'm actually factoring out the C values here. So in the second terms, they both have a C2, and the coefficients on C2 would be A2, B1, and then subtract A1, B2. And that's what we have in parentheses. And for C3, I have A3B1 minus A1B3. So now I want to find values for C3 and C2, which will make this a true statement. So I'm going to choose for C2 the exact coefficient on C3. So I'm going to choose A3B1 minus B3A1. And then for C3, I'm going to choose the opposite of the coefficient on C2. So the opposite of A2B1 minus B2A1. So that'll guarantee that I've got that product equal to zero. So now once I've made that choice, I can go ahead and find C1 using substitution. I'll use the first equation, which I can rewrite as A1C1 equals negative A2C2 minus A3C3. So I'll go ahead and replace C2 with the expression I have here in parentheses. I'll replace C3 with this expression here and multiply it out. Now, once I do that, I see that I'm going to get a simplification because the middle terms are opposites of each other. So they'll add to make zero. So I'll be left with only two terms, 
a1, a2, b3 minus a1, a3, b2. But remember, that doesn't equal c1. It equals a1 times c1. So I'm going to go ahead and divide both sides by a1, which will give me c1 equals a2 times b3 minus a3 times b2. Now there's a definite pattern in all of these expressions for my coefficients. They all start with product of two numbers, and then a subtraction, and then a product of two numbers. There's also another pattern that the indices are swapped. Here I have a2b3, then I have a3b2. And that's true with all of them. Here I have a3b1, then I have b3a1. And here I have a1b2, then I have a2b1. Now we've seen this type of pattern before. And where we saw it was in the context of a two by two determinant. So we could think of these coefficients for this or the uh, components of the C vector as being determinants. But it's even easier than that because these determinants correspond to cofactors of a three by three matrix. Now, I have to be a little careful here. It really doesn't make sense to have unit vectors or any types of vectors within a three by three matrix. But it's just there to help us remember this rather complicated formula. So this would say, oh, if I want to find in my vector the ith component, what's the coefficient on the ith component? We'll cross out the row in the column corresponding to i, calculate the minor, so a2 times b3 minus a3 times b2. That will be the coefficient on the ith component. For the jth component, remember I'll have to have a minus sign out in front, but I'll take a1 times b3, subtract off b3 times b1, and just remember to put a minus out in front of that. And then to find the kth component, I would just calculate a1 times b2 and subtract b2 times b1. So now we have the definition of our, our cross product or vector product. So we refer to the dot product as the scalar product because it produces a scalar. We refer to the cross product as a vector product because it produces a vector. And so we never really memorize this definition. We always make use of the memory aid. So let's look at an example. We've got two vectors. Vector A has components negative one, two, and zero. Vector B has components three, one, and negative two. And let's form their cross product. We'll use our memory aid. So for the ith component, my minor would be two times negative two, subtract zero times one. For j, remember this minus sign out in front. So I'm putting these big brackets to put the with the entries or the terms of the minor. So I'd have negative one times negative two, subtract off zero times three, but with that minus sign out in front. Okay, I'm back to plus again. So I'll just take negative one times one, subtract off two times three. So work out the arithmetic carefully. And I find that the cross product is a vector with components negative four, comma negative two, comma negative seven. Now, whenever you calculate the cross product, you should do at least a mental check of seeing if the cross product vector 
is orthogonal to the original vectors. So let's go ahead and take the dot product of the cross product vector with the vector a. And sure enough, if I work that out carefully, I get a positive 4 minus 4, which will equal 0. And then take the dot product with the b vector. I'll get what? Negative 12 minus 2, that's a negative 14. Then plus 14, which will equal 0. What are some properties of the cross product? Well, the way we have chosen our coefficients, because remember there's infinitely many possible uh, vectors which are going to be orthogonal to both a and b, but we have chosen our coefficients so that the cross product obeys the right hand rule, which literally means that if you were to put your index finger on the a vector and you were to put your middle finger on the b vector, then your thumb would point in the direction of A cross B. So we've constructed it so that the cross product is orthogonal to both A and B. Now, the cross product is not commutative. In other words, the order in which you cross the vectors matters. It doesn't make a big difference. It only changes the sign, but still it's different and we need to pay attention to it. And so one way we could see this is if we look at the right-hand rule. If I take these vectors and instead of putting, so instead of doing A cross B, I did B cross A, I'd have to have the index finger pointing in the direction of B. So uh, I try to rotate this diagram to demonstrate this. So now here's my index finger. This is the vector B, even though it's blue now. And here's the vector A, and the middle finger's on that. And now the cross product, the thumb is pointing downwards. And that's indicating that it's in the opposite direction. So it has the opposite sign of a cross B. We could also use a property that we learned about determinants. Now A cross B in our memory aid, we always put the first vector in the second row and the second vector goes in the third row. So if I did B cross A, now my B components are in the second row and my A components are in the third row. They have swapped rows. We've interchanged the rows. Well, we saw that when we saw our little video on determinants. One of the properties of determinants is that if you exchange any two rows or any two columns, the result is that the determinant changes sign. So our memory aid also helps us remember or establish this property that if you change the order in which you take the cross product, the result is you're going to change the sign on the cross product vector. Another amazing thing is that not only does the direction of the cross product obey the right hand rule, but the magnitude of the cross product is significant. It's meaningful. It's actually the length of a times the length of b times sine of theta, which is the area of the parallelogram determined by a and b. So a and b, two vectors, they lie in the same plane. And if I make a copy of b and a copy of a, I can form a parallelogram and the length of the cross product vector is the same as the area of that parallelogram, which is just the length of A times the length of B times sine theta. So that's an extremely useful property. And so we could always think that, you know, the, uh, there's going to be a lot of instances when we're going to try to estimate this area, and uh, we don't need to estimate it. We can just say it is the magnitude of the cross product.
Now, um, we can now come to some conclusions uh, about the angle between A and B from the cross product. Uh, one conclusion is that uh, the two vectors are parallel if and only if the cross product vector is the zero vector. But really, uh, this formula is not useful for uh, calculating angles unless you're certain that your angle is in the first quadrant because across zero to pi, the sine function is not one to one. So uh, you can't just take the inverse sine to be able to uh, determine what the angle is. You're going to have to first determine is the angle in the first quadrant or the second quadrant. And then if it is, the inverse sine will only give you um, the angle that's in the first quadrant. So then you'll have to remember to do some arithmetic to be able to find the, the actual value of the angle when it's in the second quadrant. But really, it's more work and more confusing to deal with it when using this formula. Just use the dot product formula to calculate angles. All right, some more properties of the cross product. Well, we have an associative property with a constant. So if I have a constant times a vector and then take the cross product, that's the same as first taking the cross product and then multiplying by the constant. Uh, we have a distributive property across addition of vectors. And that distributive property holds whether we're performing the cross product on the left or on the right. And that's important because remember, the order of the cross product does matter, but the distributive property still holds. And for our unit coordinate vectors, i cross j equals k, j cross k equals i, and k cross i equals j. And what this tells us is that the coordinate axes obey the right-hand rule. And in other words, if you were to put your index finger on the positive x-axis, your middle finger on the positive y-axis, then your thumb will point in the direction of the positive z-axis. So here's a, an interesting identity. If you take two vectors, b cross c, and then cross that with a, you're going to get a uh, multiple of b subtract a multiple of c. And the coefficients on those, the multipliers are a dot c and then a dot b. So what happens if you take the cross product of two vectors and then dot the result with a third vector? That's called the scalar triple product or sometimes just the triple product. Now what's interesting is that if you take b cross c first and then dot it with a, you get the same result if you take a cross b and dot it with c. Now that makes sense if we take into account this following geometric interpretation, that the absolute value of the triple scalar product is the volume of the parallel pipette determined by the vectors a, b, and c. Hmm, where have we seen the volume of the parallel pipette determined by three vectors before? Oh yes, when we looked at the properties of determinants. The absolute value of the three by three determinant is the volume of the parallel pipette determined by the vectors whose components are the three rows. And so if you think about this, then if I take B and cross it with C, its magnitude is going to be the area of the 
bottom of this parallel pipe head in this diagram. And then if I dot that with A, that will give me the volume. Well, that should be the same volume if I take A cross B, which would be the front, and dot it with C. I'm going to get the same volume. And so it makes sense that these expressions are going to be equal to each other. Now just be careful here. Uh, whenever we're talking about these interpretations, we're always looking at the absolute value. Because remember, determinants can be positive, negative, or zero. And the same thing with dot products. So what this tells me, though, is that I have a simple way of calculating the scalar triple product. I don't have to go through and first calculate the cross product, then calculate a dot product. I can just evaluate this three by three determinant. So an application of the cross product is torque. Torque is a turning or twisting force. You know, you might hear about torque uh, when uh, people talk about engines, and that is telling you the force in which the crankshaft might be turning, or you may have torque with an electric motor. Again, that's the force with which the uh, shaft of the motor is turning. And so uh, we use the Greek letter tau to represent torque. It is a vector. And uh, the formula is going to be R cross F. And we think of it this way. R is the length of the arm, and F is the force applied to that arm. So kind of like a lever. Example you want to think about is if you have a wrench and you're trying to apply some twisting force to a bolt here, to the head of a bolt, that is going to result in some torque. And what's going to happen is you're going to apply force to either tighten or loosen the bolt. So here we have a, a wrench. It has a length of a quarter meter. And somebody's applying a force of 40 newtons, not exactly perpendicular to the wrench, but at a degree, at an angle of 60 degrees with the line passing through the center of the wrench. So let's calculate the torque. And let's see also, is this uh, result of this going to make the bolt get tighter or looser if it's a right-hand bolt? All right, so let's look at this in terms of vector. The distance from the center of the bolt to where the force is being applied, that is what we call the arm of this force. And so that is our R vector. And then at the head of the R vector, that's where the force is being applied. And what we'd like to do is find the components of these vectors. Well, to make it easier, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the x-axis directly on the line of the wrench. The y-axis is going to be parallel. And then let's think about our right-hand rule. If I put my index finger on the x-axis and put my middle finger on the positive y-axis, and my thumb is going to point straight out of the board. And so uh, that tells me that the Z axis is pointing out of the board or out of the screen towards me. All right, so now using that set of axes, let's see if we can find the components of the R vector and the F vector. Now the R vector only has one component, the component in the i direction. But the f vector has a component in the i direction and in the j direction. To find that, I'm just going to solve this right triangle. Now it's a 60 degree 
uh, angle here. So I have a 60, 30, 90 triangle. And so I'm just going to use our properties. Uh, I know that the uh, shortest side will be half the hypotenuse and uh, the longer side will be root three over two times the hypotenuse. So that says that the F vector would be 20i minus 20 rad 3j. Why minus? Because it points in the minus y direction there. The R vector then only has that one component, uh, which we'll write as one quarter i, because it's one quarter meter. Let's go ahead and calculate the cross product. Well, you say to yourself, well, wait a minute, they don't have a z component. Well, no, the z component, we just didn't write it down. The z component is zero. So we can still calculate the cross product. And using our memory aid, we'll find that the i component and the j component are both zero. And the k component is just going to be negative five radical three. So now let's check. What does that tell me? We said that the z positive z axis points out. That means that the negative z axis is pointing into the board. So if we have a right-hand thread on our bolt, then the result of the action of applying this force to that wrench is that the bolt should be trying to go in to the bowl board. In other words, it should be trying to get tighter. And so there we go. That makes sense. If I put my index finger on R and I put my middle finger on F, then my thumb points into the board. So we'll be using the cross product many times throughout the course, and I hope you find this video useful.